Hello and welcome to the Whole of My Heart podcast. This is episode 222, Q&A with the Kriegs, Therapy, Burnout, and Your LGBTQQs. You nailed that. <laughs> Q&A with the Kriegs, Therapy. We're going to talk how to evaluate a therapist, burnout, and your LGBTQQs. Welcome to the Whole of My Heart podcast where we talk about how the gospel is good news for everyone, every day. I'm your host, Lori Krieg, and I'm coming at you from the lovely WCSG radio studio in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where the photo behind me, the picture behind me, <laughs> just got spray painted with a mat, two T's and an E, <laughs> Matt Krieg next to me, <laughs> and it's letting off some fumes. We had to spray paint it because it was too shiny. It's a little shiny still. still. But anyway, if you guys hear us just start rambling and coherently it's because we are full of happening. fumes it's already <laughs> happening <laughs> but i do have alongside me my husband and favorite licensed therapist and favorite matt matt creek how are you <laughs> i'm good <laughs> Thanks for that wonderful intro. <laughs> <laughs> Telling you the fumes. This is what we like to call in the industry, loose cannon Lori. This Ooh. could either be really good or really bad. Uh, and we have with us our friend and the most professional radio voice among us, producer Steve. Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Not high, I don't think. We'll see. <laughs> These fumes are intense. Anyway, guys, we are just going to dive into your Q&A. Uh, you send us questions throughout the year to podcast at lauriecreek.com or you message me on Instagram or you find me on the Hold My Heart podcast Facebook group and you email me questions, which is so great. And I try and answer them as quickly as possible. Sorry if there's some delays, uh, but I've either been harvesting, keeping these questions, or I got a fresh batch. That was our question of the week from last time. So we're going to dive into the questions of your year based on some of, uh, this is kind of the end. We actually have one more episode that we're going to be doing to finish the season. But this is kind of the summary of the last um, interviews that we've been doing. And so we want to answer these questions. So Steve's going to interview us. But Steve, yeah. I'm sure I'll be asking some questions back oh, to you. Okay. All right. I was real comfortable with the role of just tossing the questions out, uh, fielding them and kind of yeah. moderating, you know, moderating. Sure. Sure. I, I do love learning aside you guys. And so, uh, I'll throw out the questions and assign them to you to answer. Perfect. This first one is for both of you. So, uh, we'll start with Matt. Uh, how do you know if your therapist isn't a good fit? What's the balance between taking time to work through things and heal uh, versus things not healing because you're just not with the right help to guide you through? Yeah, I mean, I think the first question that you need to ask yourself is, well, do I feel like I am ready to explore and examine things that my therapist is not? Mm. Um, you know, there are certain times where either it's a topic or um, a certain modality, if like I'm not an EMDR therapist, if someone wants to do EMDR, they should not be working with me. They, they would need to work with someone else. Um, but there's also certain topics where, you know, therapists are people. And so if a therapist has teenagers at home and you're talking about maybe conflict with your teenager, that's probably going to bring up some countertransference in the therapist where they're going to be kind of living in their own world. Mm. Um, and so there's just certain times when a therapist is not a good fit. That doesn't mean they're not a good therapist. It doesn't mean that at another time in life, they may not be a good fit. Um, but if you feel like there's something that is causing the therapist to be hesitant, I would say it's, it's time to, to look for something else. The second piece. Wait, can you explain what countertransference is? Because you say that to me a lot. And every time you say it, I yeah, forget so what it means. So <laughs> countertransference would be something where something that is happening in the life of the client is stirring up something in me as the therapist. And there's times when that's good. You can empathize. Um, like there's certain levels of it that is, that is okay and manageable. Um, but if it's something where it's like the therapist's eyes go off of the client and become kind of overly attuned to their own story, then they're not actually attuning to the client anymore. Mm -hmm. And that is when it becomes a negative thing. Um, so the first thing is like to, to really say like, is there a competency issue? Is there something maybe in the life story of the therapist that is impeding their ability to work with whatever you're trying to work through? And then the third thing I would ask is, do you trust your therapist? If you don't trust your therapist, if you feel like you have to hide things from them, hmm. you might want to find someone else. That's good, Matt. Yeah. I wrote down one note in answer to this question is I've seen 
many therapists, not to brag, uh, <laughs> but I've been in therapy a lot. And at least I've seen probably five on like a long-term basis. And I feel like I'm like, I think I'm done with them. And I'm either ready to just take a break from therapy or I need to go somewhere else who like Matt, you said you don't do EMDR. Or I'm like, I need EMDR, I feel, um, is when I notice when the therapist keeps saying the same things to me like their advice Mm. or which I know you're not even really supposed to give advice or their Mm. best thoughts and how they're processing is like the same thing over and over. And I'm like, I think I've tapped out their uh, file cabinet in their (laughs) mind in how to help me. And then that's fine. That's nothing against them. It's just, it's time to move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say as a therapist, anytime a client is coming to me with like a, Hey, I think it might be time for me to move on. That's a celebration. Mm. Um, I mean, unless like something, I, I've actually never had it where someone's like, you're the worst therapist ever. And I really hate working with you. <laughs> I want my um, money back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, transitioning out of therapy, when you walk into the therapist's office, that is ultimately the goal. So I know sometimes people feel bad, like they're letting their therapist down. If they're like, Hey, I think I need to be done. Like, no, that's a good thing. That means movement has happened. And you know, if, if you need to go find someone else to work on something more specific, that is okay. Mm. So don't feel bad about that. Hmm. And if your therapist is like super sad about it, like they can be sad, but if they're like exhibiting codependent responses to you, that's a sign of a bad therapist, isn't it? Yes. Yes. (laughs) You just reminded me, I I think she'd be okay with this. Uh, My wife is in therapy and a couple of weeks ago really had kind of like a breakthrough where for the first time she kind of saw the path mm-hmm. forward, like in terms of like light at the end of the tunnel, I don't think we're done right now, but I can see the progress and where in maybe a couple of months it might be, we, we might be celebrating like mm-hmm. you said, Matt. So mm. um, that's, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's great. that is cool. All right. Next one. Uh, do you have any advice on how to mentor someone with unwanted sexual behaviors or attractions? So Lori, let's start with you on this one and then Matt can answer too. So I'm going to just punt to a couple of favorite books. First of all, um, the book unwanted by Jay Stringer is a great one. Uh, he, we've interviewed him a couple times on here, at least once. Mm -hmm. So if you Google my name and his name, you can listen to our episode together, but just get his book. It's so great. I know he does courses as well. And then, uh, my book, uh, journey. Well, that was one we ended up self publishing because I was simultaneously writing an impossible marriage. Um, so you can look up journey while it's on Amazon. It's also on Westbo press, but that is the story of my walking with my mentor counselor, Carolyn, uh, when I was not going from gay to straight, but going from really owned by my sexual brokenness to finding freedom in Christ and seeing the sexual brokenness as something I can walk with, but not be enslaved to. So that I would recommend, um, The general thing I'm going to say, and then I'll point to you, Matt, is try and listen when you're walking with someone for the deeper needs beneath the wants. So Mm. even if they're born that way, everyone is born with broken sexuality. But here's an example. Um, I often give this one of um, my friend Kat, which she's given me permission to share this. And so I share on stages when I was walking with her. She was still dating her girlfriend or in the stages of dating and questioning that. And she was like, man, Lori, I really just want to marry my girlfriend. Now, someone might hear that and be like, okay, bye. This conversation's done. Clearly, I know what you're about. But the curious person I am and understanding the deeper needs beneath the wants, I asked the question, why? Why do you want to marry her? And she said, well, I really want a honeymoon. Again, I could have said, Bye bye. Mm. I know what you're about here. Let's leave. I'm an, I'm a good conservative Christian. No, I was listening for the needs beneath the wants. And I said, why a honeymoon? And she said, I am just really tired and I need a break. Hmm. So if you've been journeying with us for any amount of time, you'll know that that is one of the core needs that we have for rest. And I know, as I was talking with Kat, is that the only place to find true rest is not on a honeymoon with someone that you love, but it is in Christ. And so I said, well, you know, I, I'm, I don't know how direct I was in that moment, but I did take note in that moment. And I thought, Kat just self-diagnosed 
how and where she needs God right now. Is she needs to find her rest in him. How can I help her experience that rest in him so that this other love isn't as uh, tangible, isn't as palpable, isn't as like, that's going to fix me. But she sees that God is the one who can journey with her and give her that true rest. So that's what I'm always listening for is self-diagnosis of where and how people need God. What would you add, Matt? Yeah, I would, I would just add, you can, you can work on redirecting those unwanted behaviors, um, whether it's pornography, masturbation, whatever, like um, by kind of looking for those needs that are underneath that behavior. Uh, I, would, I would say, don't make the focus on changing the attraction. No. Because mm-hmm. I don't believe that's, I, I don't know how to do that. I don't believe that is a, you know, to change someone usually stereotypically would be from, you know, same sex attractions to opposite sex attractions. We're not trying to quote unquote, make someone straight. Um, and, and so like to, to work on someone's behaviors with them as a mentor is fine. I would say to normalize the attractions and to make it so that like they have a curiosity about the attractions, not this like demonization of the attraction that they may hold. Mm. So to be more curious about it Mm -hmm. than uh, hating it, which we've talked about that here with Kurt Thompson. I'm sure I've alluded to it. If you've heard me speak anywhere is how focusing on the thing you hate about yourself which piles on toxic shame Mm -hmm. actually shuts your brain down and makes you think it like use the reptilian parts of your brain, fight, flight, food, reproduction. (laughs) Uh, You can't, when you focus in on the thing you hate about yourself so much, you actually can't even work on that thing until you get curious about it and hold it with open hands instead of hatred. God looks at us with love. He doesn't look at us with this hatred. And so can we look at ourselves with the same love and curiosity while still seeing things as sin, but do we have to hate ourselves into holiness? Mm. Seeing behaviors as sin. Yeah, seeing behaviors as sin. Not attractions as sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I have a question just about um, that relationship with Kat, Mm -hmm. where you're her mentor, uh, and you have that moment of that conversation where she's clearly knows she's safe to tell you mm-hmm. that she wants to marry her girlfriend. Um, but then you're asking questions. How did you establish, I guess the ground rules to that relationship mm-hmm. to where you were able to get there? Um, did, was it just something that happened organically or did you have like, did she ask you to be her mentor or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Which I'm going to have Kat, God willing, back on the podcast in the fall to unpack some of our discipleship journey, because Mm. I think it is a really important one that we can be so intimidated by, uh, is how do we walk with LGBT people, but really discipleship in general, we can Mm -hmm. talk about more. The ground rules we set were, I offered her hospitality by saying at church, you're welcome to sit with us. I'm going to save you a seat. Yeah. And then she Googled me and determined by the grace of God, I wasn't a total crazy head. And (laughs) she wanted me to walk with her and asked, Hey, I have questions. Can I, will you walk with me? And I think what helped if I can be so bold is that I did not see cat as a project Mm. or as my like LGBTQ pet. (laughs) You know, we recently, um, had our friends at Kaleidoscope talk uh, to Elizabeth Black, talked about that. Like these these people, this isn't my mission field, but people are not a mission. Mm. Um, so Kat felt that. So the walking together, so she, even though she asked me, I think she felt free to ask vulnerable questions or say things like that because yeah. she didn't feel like I was going to patronize her and scoff or be like, well, that's sinful, but to ask curious questions. And then from what I understand, let's ask her in the fall when we interview <laughs> her. But I think she felt free to um, be so vulnerable. Okay. That's, that's helpful. Uh, all right. Next question. What would you recommend are some good practices for helping people who are burnt out in ministry? Uh, And Lori, let's have you answer that one first and then Matt also. So I just had a very busy season this spring and I started to get a little scared 
because I've hit a burnout wall and I started to see signs of burnout in myself. So I think it's wise to notice signs of burnout in yourself. Mm. Uh, For me, sometimes it's like big time apathy. I just don't care. I just stop caring about everything. Everyone, nobody matters, (laughs) not even myself. Um, Because I'm in self-preservation mode, I get angry. I can see anger in myself. Um, My idols are like so palpable. And by that, for me, it's like my perfectionism is off the charts. Mm. I just feel like I have to be perfect in everything. My performance, I have to do everything right. Um, Maybe my sexuality that hasn't been as big of an issue right now, but maybe that would go elevated because all these things are saying... I don't know who I am right now. And my soul is grasping at something tangible while self-preserving with anger and apathy. Does this make sense? So, yeah. what were you? Uh, well, just that sentence, I don't know who I am right now. I think yeah. that's really significant. Mm-hmm. I'd never, because I've hit burnout walls as well. Yeah. And just, I don't know, I've never had that sentence, but that's really helpful. Well, I'm just learning it this second time around where I'm like, uh-oh. What's happening? So I start, when I notice all my idols going nuts or I notice my uh, emotions going angry or apathetic, especially, or anxious, then I got to ask, how's my soul? Which is a hard question to ask. Uh, I have a spiritual director who helps me ask that question. I'm married to an amazing person who also helps to ask that question. Steve, I know you're married to an amazing person. Mm -hmm. You can ask that too. And then, so I keep going back from identity to practical, identity to practical. So I ask, how's my soul? And it's probably not good. If my idols are out of control, if I'm in this angry place, like I'm not great. So then it's like, okay, we're in emergency mode. What practically can I quit right now? Or how can I adjust my schedule? And sometimes it's as much as you need to delete all the social media apps on your phone to get a little bit of time back. Because sometimes you can't quit your job. You can't quit, you know, being a parent. And then I go back to identity after I give myself a little space and I ask why and how did I let myself really is why first, why did I let my soul get this ragged? And usually it's like, well, I'm a victim. I'm a victim to my whole world. I have to do this. I have to, I have to, I have to, but there's maybe some yeses or some deadlines I put on myself too quickly that I could have said no to. And then I got to ask, why did I say yes? And it goes back to that identity not rooted in Christ is, well, it feels good to be asked to do things. It feels good to make money. Come through for people. Come through, be the hero. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I, I have to, once I finally get to a place of where I can get alone is, okay, how can I not do this again? And that's where I am right now is what, what practices do I need to put back in place uh, so that my soul can be healthy the next time around and I can say yes and no with an emphatic yes and no. What would you add, Matt? Um, yeah, I mean, from a, a counseling or a helping professional standpoint, one of the questions I ask my, um, my workers at the office, the other counselors, is are you working harder for your clients than they are working for themselves? Um, And I feel like that's something that a ministry professional could also ask themselves. If they are working harder for the lives of their, um, you know, ministry people that they're ministering to, than those people are, that is a recipe for burnout because you are taking responsibility um, over something that you have no control over. Um, And so if that's the case, I, I would say, to, to try and take some of that energy and attention that you're putting into that and, and to kind of turn it back inward and say, okay, I've, I've overextended trying to care for other people. How do I actually extend some of that attention and time to myself with some of these practices, Lori, that you're saying, right? You're identifying, okay, how are my idols? How is my heart? Like, what can I change, you know, to move into that tangible, you know, alteration of what the schedule might look like? Mm-hmm. I'll add to, I started making a list of like, how do I know I'm healthy? I've started to notice like, how do I know when I'm unhealthy? But like, what are my healthy practices? And like, these are maybe, yes, I know, Bible, journal, devotional. But then I added like, just reflection time. 
Like, am I taking time to just be quiet, no phone, no nothing, and just asking, how am I doing? Um, I know I'm healthy when I have spiritual director or, so, or a friend who's asking a question. I know I'm healthy when I have friendships or I'm playing, I'm laughing with my family. Um, and, and I know I'm healthy when I'm mentoring a few people not a thousand people. <laughs> that for me is one. So that may be worth it too, is when do you know you're actually healthy uh, from your soul? All right. Um, I, I, I'm considering taking notes on, but uh, I've, I've got this little outline, so that will help me because okay. that was a really good one for me to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next one. How do I tell my kids about my friend, uh, an adult who is transitioning. How do I talk to the kids about that? So Lori, you can start on that one. Yes. So this is a question we're getting more and more is adults are having to explain that their sister, their brother, their aunt, their uncle, their mom, their dad, their best friend is transitioning from male to female. How do you tell young kids this? Mm -hmm. Like what's the right thing? What's the wrong thing? Um, I'm just going to put out there that I know that there's a lot of language right now, a lot of controversy about, you know, what language do you use, what pronouns. So I'm just going to give you best practices that we're using in our home based on the worldview and the philosophy that we hold to, which is uh, using pronouns and language as a missiological uh, tool. So missiological, it's like missions, is that we're trying to be missionaries to people in, in order to earn relational equity to preach the gospel with the end goal that these people who are choosing to transition would ideally align with their biological sex. But I go on the journey with people, and I want to teach my kids to go on the journey with people. So that's our philosophy. That's our ideological worldview. If you guys hold to a different one that's, uh, you know, maybe more liberal, more conservative, we respect you. We love you. You're welcome here. So I'm just going to give you the language that we use in our home. Uh, so how I talk about it is that some people, so I'd say to my little kids, so our kids right now are four, seven, nine. So this is the age group I'm picturing that I'm talking to. So people are born either male or female, and they have, like dads have penises, <laughs> moms have vaginas. We use that language, which uh, that'll probably be another topic of conversation. We've talked about it here, but to use proper language helps to prevent child abuse uh, and assault and things like that is to not make pet names. So we use those names not to be vulgar, but because that's what they're called mm -hmm. in science. <laughs> so they have moms and dads and men and women have body parts to match. But there's some people who, when they look inside themselves, they don't feel like they match their body parts. They don't feel like the girl that they were born or like the boy they were born. And then I probably pause. What do you think about that? What? You know, kids are going to be very honest. What do you mean? And I might have to explain that again. And then I would bring up this friend, this aunt, this uncle. Hey, do you know uncle whomever? So he was born a man but he doesn't feel like he's a man on the inside. He's struggling. And that's a real struggle. You guys, you struggle with stuff, don't you? And I may, we, we talk about struggles in our home all the time <laughs> is Gwen, you struggle with this. Juliet, you struggle with this. Ellis and dad struggles with, we don't get off the hook as parents. <laughs> we're regular. What do I say about you? I'm like, dad struggles with anxiety. So does mom. <laughs> we're like, and so that's a normal conversation. And then I'll say, and we ask, just like you guys ask God for help with your struggles. Our uncle, he's struggling, but he's not going to God to help him with this struggle right now. Now, I don't know what their faith is. You guys are going to have to navigate those specific nuances, but let's say they're not a Christian. They're not going to God. And instead of asking God, God, will you help me with my struggling with how I feel inside? They're saying, I'm actually going to go with the struggle. I'm actually going to say yes to what's going on inside. And I'm going to change my outside body to match how I feel inside. Now, I've had this sort of conversation with my kids, mm. and they usually go, oh, what? Because kids, is very black and white. What do you mean they're not listening to God? What do you mean they're not going to God for their struggles? But that, when I have actually had this conversation with them, it, they digested it, is instead of asking God for help in our struggles, which is so normal, and this is real with our uncle, they're choosing to go with the struggle. So 
that's a bummer, isn't it? It's really sad. Yeah, why would they do that? So yeah, our uncle, he's actually going to be your aunt now. Now, this is not me saying a real story of the Creek household. We don't have aunts (laughs) and uncles transitioning. Don't try and Google and find it. (laughs) Just giving an example, uh, an anonymous example. So now he's actually going to be your aunt. What? Yep. So you're going to actually call him her, but he's a guy. I know. And we can know that in our heads and in our hearts, but we're using that language because we're trying to honor him where he's at. Now I may, I haven't had to do this whole, like from start to finish with someone that close, like an aunt or an uncle yet. I may say, you know, when we're just us, we're going to call him uncle, blah, blah. But when we're with him, we're going to say, uh, his new name, just to honor him where he's at. I, I Don't quote me on that. That's not Bible for Lori right now. I'm still debating what if I might do that or not, if it might be different in our home versus not, just because these are little kids and little minds. And I want them to be like, no, he is a man, but we're honoring him where he's at. We're respecting him and we're praying that he knows Jesus so that he is able to do this uh struggle with Jesus. Now I'm going to say one more thing that I do say to them that I feel more clear on is, you know what, even though that he's transitioning, he's never actually going to be a woman. Hmm. He can't ever actually have babies. He can't, he won't ever have a period. My two older girls, they know about that. Just so that that's clear. It's not, and, and again, is it a little vague because they're so black and white? Like it's like boy or girl or boy or girl. Yeah, it's a little bit vague, but that I have said because then they're like, oh, he's not actually turning into a girl. He's just kind of acting like one. Now, I hope you guys hear, maybe I'll change some nuances in the next years, but I hope you hear tenderness in my voice. I hope you hear me validating that this uncle is really struggling. And I hope you hear me trying to be like, all right, kids, let's get on the mission of God, the Missio Day. We're trying to journey with them on this journey. What would you guys add? What are you thinking? Yeah. I mean, and I think I'm glad you said the last piece, because I think the, the big thing when parents tend to approach this type of topic, it's with this kind of fearful desire for their kids to know like the black and white truth of you know, they were born a man or they were born a woman. Um, and it often is missing that like compassion mm-hmm. piece. And and you can share truth. You can share like, you know, the, the reality of what is going on in this person's life while also trying to instill compassion, um, you know, and this missiological, like we still care for this person. Right. We, we love this person. Um, if this person is talking bodily transition, that usually means there's some intense anxiety and dysphoria mm. about pieces of their body. And that is something that, uh, that it would just be hard for anyone to work right. with. And, and mm. so um, to, to have the compassion, to have, yes, an understanding of the, some of the nuances as much as you can with, you know, whatever age your kid is, but, but also like really lead with, we still love this person, even if we don't believe they're actually going to be turning into a man or a woman because that is not how they were born. That's not how they were created. Which to piggyback on that piggyback is people can yell that, well, you're not actually a woman, but like put yourself in their shoes. They're spending so much money. They want to be seen as a Mm. woman. Like, isn't that sad? Like, isn't it sad when we chase after so many things thinking that it's going to make it all better and we know it's it's never going to actually scratch the edge of their heart. They're never going to actually be a woman. So can, can we know that and maybe even say it, but speak it from a heart that's tender and compassionate and sad that, man, doesn't it stink that idols don't work? Mm. Yeah, I think what I hear that is so important is... Um, the way you're approaching it as a struggle and that every single struggle we have, God wants us to invite him into it, to yes. walk with him through it. Because I think a lot of parents, I'm just going to say, I think what happens a lot is that we don't want to talk about it with our kids because we don't want to introduce the possibility to our yeah, kids. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's a fear that 
I'm going to say this in some way that what they'll take away is, oh, that's an option. I could do that. Mm -hmm. And that's a fear that a lot of us have as parents. Um, But the way you're approaching it is you're, you're telling the truth, the whole truth, Mm -hmm. what the person is experiencing and what we all experience and how God is God through all of it. And so anyway, I, I, I really think it, it may happen. Like yeah. this may happen. This may be something that your kid walks through. Mm-hmm. And if you have this conversation, it's, it doesn't mean it's your fault, you know, right. like I, I think that that's a lot of fear that mm. parents have. Yeah. Well, and, and to take that, your kids will be introduced to this at some right. point, if it's at school, if it's online, if it's by a friend. Um, if you're not talking about it, the only place they're going for information and guidance is to those sources. So right. as a parent, please talk. Yes. Please talk with compassion and please be be open to have this conversation to guide your kids as they are wrestling with just identity development mm-hmm. in general, whether it's gender or sexual or something else to, to be a part of that conversation with them. And two things on that, and I know we, we got to wrap it up here pretty soon, uh, is we will add often when we bring these things up. And if you guys ever struggle with these things, you're welcome to come talk to us. And they, they, I could tell, like, they'll bring up like, Hey, sometimes it's hard to be a girl in this scenario, or sometimes I don't Mm. feel like a, like a, like Ellis can't quite say feel like a boy, but he's just like, like he'll have, like I could tell he's just like, what's it mean to belong? Which Mm. isn't that so normal. And so then to even have that belonging, what's it mean to be a girl when girl is defined differently than when I was a kid, which was like Mm -hmm. Polly Pockets in third grade. Now it's like TikTok in third grade. Mm. It's different. So I think that has invited some conversations. And then if I may add to, is experientially in our home, we have seen our kids who have friends, people close to them who are transitioning or have, they did not have to be fed rage and othering in order to have a heart that is both passionate for truth and grieving over sin. Like when we've told them some of their friends, people close to them are transitioning, they're like, what? But it's not what we hate them. It's, Mm. are you kidding me? It, It was breaking their heart, which that's what sin does mm. is it breaks God's heart. And so I was shocked to see like, I, we didn't, we have not fed this animosity. We have not done it perfectly, but the fruit that we're seeing in our kids is heartbreak and oh, I still love them. So that's, mm. what, that's what I want to see. Okay. Last question. Uh, man, this has been so good. And the time has flown. Uh, how do you recognize when seasons of struggle and temptation is coming from sinful nature versus from spiritual attack? Uh, and Matt, uh, let's have you start on that one. Yeah. I, I mean, there, there's such a diffuse line here because right. oftentimes spiritual attack will try and stir up some of those sinful natures that we, we, have wrestled with. I think one of the places where I can see that it is maybe more of a spiritual attack, there's usually something important coming up. Um, and honestly, it's usually our kids will be feeling very similar things, even though they're very different personalities. Um, so they're like the barometer in the home. They, there's so a saying. little bit of a canary in a coal mine. I feel mm-hmm. like if all of the kids are coming into our room scared, um, you know, when, it's not something that they would all have that like habit of doing, then I can, I I feel like there's some level of spiritual kind of attack going on. Um, For someone without kids, what would you say to them? What would be the canary in the coal mine? I mean, this might be just my personal thought, but you know what your temptations are. You know what your general kind of, habits and and hangups are going to be. And if it's something that kind of feels like you're being pulled in a different direction than those, then I would say, consider that maybe it's a spiritual thing going on. Here's what I do is if it similar is if it feels like it's kind of coming out of nowhere and you're like, wait, what the, what the, and I, I just will pray out loud. Like I just pray against the enemy in the strong and mighty name of Jesus Christ. Just get away from me, go to the cross and be gone. And 
sometimes it's just boom, it's gone. And I'm like, oh, well, you didn't get me. Not today, Satan. <laughs> um, and then sometimes it, I can tell it, it's more just sinful nature and attached to a need beneath my want is when I ask the temptation, what are you promising me? And it will say back to me, usually a core need, seen, known, loved, belong, etc. And then I can know, all right, this is this is just classic Lori going to idols instead of Jesus. And uh, then I can just say, how can I get that need met in ways that are both honoring to God and honoring to myself and will actually satisfy? Okay, hmm. we have 10,000 more questions, <laughs> and that's usual. So you guys, if you have more questions, you are always welcome to friend me on Instagram. I may punt you. I say punt a lot, even though I don't play football, but we're going to punt you to my email because it's so much easier for me to answer you there. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram, Lori underscore Krieg. I love to hear your questions. Uh, we do have a question of the week for next time, our final episode of the season, which is going to be great talking about how do we talk to kids about sexuality and gender with Julia Sadusky. It's going to be great, God willing. Um, the question of the week for next time is, do you, this is from one of you guys, do you like ice in your water? Yes or no? And if you do like ice, is it round or square? Oh. Which kind of ice do you like? Very important. Two-part question. A good summer <laughs> one. Okay, guys, thanks so much for joining us today. If you like the podcast, feel free to rate and review it. And if you really like the podcast, we would love if you would consider being a supporter of it. We will throw your name on the WCSG Airwaves, which reaches... A lot of people in the, it's about 100,000 a week. So if you guys want to reach out to, I'll send you directly to me, LK, the letters LK at lauriecreek.com. I'd love to have a conversation with you and to connect you with WCSG to see how you can support the podcast. All right. Thanks so much, Steve. You did a great job interviewing. Oh, thanks. It's like you've done this before. <laughs> great questions. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jesus. Thank yeah. you guys for listening. And for all of us here at the Hold My Heart podcast, we'll see you next time.